born in Tracy Brebin was born in the Yorkshire town of Bigley. Tracy Brebin was an actress, a TV writer prior to entering politics, appearing in Coronation Street, EastEnders, Casualty, and Emma Dome. She was elected MP for Bigley in Spain in 2016 after the tragic assassination of former LWN chair, Joe Cox MP. Tracy was appointed the Shadow Secretary of State for Digital, Culture, Media, Sport in January 2020. And she served within the same team on the Key Star Man, performing as a passionate advocate for creative industries. Tracy was elected Labour Mayor of West Yorkshire, that's the Labour Stroke Cooperative Mayor of West Yorkshire in May 2021. The first ever woman metro mayor in almost 20 years since the creation of a directly elected mayor of London. Since our election, Tracy has worked on attracting wow. investment and infrastructure to her region, West Yorkshire, reducing violence against women, building affordable homes and tackling climate change. Well done, Tracy, and welcome to these events, Tracy. I'm so happy to be here. <clears throat> I'm weirdly in the biggest wedding venue in the country, in Bradford, in the middle of an event, but I couldn't miss this. So thank you, Busy, for that really warm welcome. And honestly, it's so great to see so many friends, colleagues, campaigners, and fantastic women on this call. So thank you, Busy. Thank you, Tracy. It's, it's an honor to have you here, Tracy? So you're Yorkshire born and bred. Please, can you tell us a bit more about your background? Because I'm sure our sisters will like to hear from you directly about your background. Oh, well, thank you. Um, well, um, born and raised in Batley, like you say, um, council flat uh, with a sister, uh, mum and dad. Um, we were in a situation where um, my, we were, we'd bought a house, but my dad lost his job and we couldn't continue paying for it. So my mom handed the keys back to, um, to the, um, mortgage company, the building society. And basically we ended up homeless and my dad then had to go to the council and try and get us somewhere to live. And there was something about that moment that was quite pivotal, um, just feeling, even as a small child, that sense of anxiety from my parents about what the future held. Anyway, so that's, that sense of uh, security stayed with me that we were, you know, we would always have that safe, that safe space and, you know, be um, uh, whatever circumstances we were in, my dad was always in that work. We'd always have that roof over our head. But I always wanted to be an actor and I never knew where it came from. And um, I did, my mom tells me precociously, I said as a small child, when am I going to be famous? And it sounds, it sounds quite normal now with Instagram and all of that, but it did, it did seem quite odd coming out of a, a very young child, but wanted to perform, um, you know, very difficult, not knowing anybody, not having any connections or any money to go to drama school or, you know, to have even that thought. Um, but I was um, lucky that I got uh, a good education and got the chance to go to university. So I did drama at Loughborough um, in order to pursue, you know, that performing um, opportunity, but also to knowing that that was probably the only way that I could get going. Um, and then, um, well, I was one of those sad people that are left behind when everybody leaves university because I had a place at drama school to do an MA in London, but I didn't know anybody. I had no money. I didn't know how to do it. So I let the place go. Uh, but a friend took pity on me and said I should go and sleep on her floor. And I spent a fair bit of time um, in what's called at the time Daily Issue and DSS. So I was in the queue with alcoholics and drug addicts because I was a vulnerable young woman in London with no money. Um, so that sort of got me going and I started to get work. I worked in a bar and I worked on a market and then I worked in recruitment for many years, but still wanted to act and uh, ended up doing five years in community theatre 
and um, and TIE, uh, Theatre and Education, and then got a great job. And anyone in the school who's old enough to remember a bit of a do, I was opposite David Jason. I played his girlfriend, Sandra, who was a clumsy waitress, and it sort of got me going. But I never forgot um, my roots. I never forgot um, where I came from. So the Labour Party was obviously my natural home. I campaigned uh, to support the miners when they were on strike. I um, spent time at Greenham Common. I, um, I was attacked at university and went on a personal journey into feminism and um, really learned a lot from the women around me and uh, always felt that my heart was with the Labour Party. So campaigned alongside people who were standing and who were um, uh, councillors and MPs to try and, you know, to help them get elected. I had small children, so I couldn't tour. I did a master's in screenwriting and became a writer. But my work with the Labour Party continued. And when I heard that um, there was a young, amazing woman standing in Batley and Spen, um, my hometown, who um, uh, was, you know, really phenomenal, I met Jo in London and realized, you know, she's going to be a phenomenal MP, started campaigning, supporting her. Uh, when she was elected, we had a campaign around library closures in Batley. And then, of course, we all know the tragic um, uh, murder of Joe and the devastation that that's caused in our community. So when I went to the funeral, I said to one of her very close friends, um, you know, what can I do to support the community and it was almost an aside she said do you want to be an MP and it was just the penny dropped of course that's what I must do it's my town Joe was my friend I've I've come into a situation where you know nobody could have anticipated it um and I just felt I, I needed to put my you know to put my hat in the ring obviously lots of other people stood um, and there was a selection process uh, and then a horrendous by-election um, when um, the far right decided they wouldn't step back and they forced us into a by-election when the other major parties stood to one side. And um, it was a bit hor horrible. Well, it was very horrible. Uh, but anyway, uh, the by-election happened. I was elected and that's where we got to. But um, certainly, you know, being a, a Yorkshire woman born and raised in Yorkshire, those those working class values that have really stayed with me all my life, a free, you know, free education, brilliant libraries, opportunities to pursue my dreams all came from a Labour government, Labour councils. So, you know, it's it's through me, uh, through and through my Yorkshire values, as well as my Labour values. Thanks, Busy. Fantastic. Fantastic, Tracy. You are an inspiration. Thank you so much for your words. So, sisters, please feel free to tweet your highlights from these events. If there's anything that stands out to you because there's so much to learn from Tracy. So, Tracy, um, we are the Labour Women's Network. We are hugely proud of you for becoming the first ever woman Metro Mayor. So, how did it feel to smash that glass ceiling, Tracy? Well, goodness me. Um... I, 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 I'm going to be honest, I feel enormously proud. Um, I, I feel I am standing on the shoulders of giants and I want to thank all those women who, um, you know, broke the glass ceiling before me. I'd also like to just pay a personal thanks to Nan Sloan on this call. She was my candidate aide during the election and you all know Nan and there is nothing you cannot achieve with Nan Sloan by your side. So, uh, you know, we everything we do is always a team effort. And also um, to, you know, to know that when Joe and I were door knocking and she said, you know, you should think about a career in politics and then to be in this position and for Joe's husband to say, Joe would be very proud of you. It means a great deal. Um, and I did feel that when I was looking around, um, having been a campaigner for devolution as a member of parliament, to which is the woman I can get behind, who can I support? And realizing that actually I can't tell other women to step up. 
all the time, which is what I do, if I don't have the courage myself. And um, I know it's a bit naff, but there, there is a, a jewellery company called Tatty Divine that some of you may know. And the statue in Westminster of Millicent Fawcett holding that banner, Courage Calls to Courage Everywhere. I've had since I became a, an MP, uh, they do a, a necklace, which is like, an, uh, it's, it, it looks like that sort of brass banner. And I think we all owe it to, to each other and we all need to thank each other because whatever courage we show in whatever circumstances, that also sends a message to other women um, that, you know, be brave, step up, but also try and surround yourself with uh, women allies and women who will campaign and you know, work with you and you know share your values. And there are many on this call who have spent many hours campaigning on the phone for, for my election as mayor. So I absolutely did not do this on my own. This is a team effort to get a woman over the line when of course we're in a patriarchy, misogyny. And some of you may have seen when there was the, the nervousness around the Batley and Spen um, seat, um, potentially that we could lose it. There was press saying, how, how, you know, why did Keir allow Tracy to stand? And you think nobody allows a woman to make that decision. She makes her own decision. But we're still fighting the patriarchy, really. And, um, you know, there are, more, there are more mayors called Andy um, <laughs> uh, than there are women mayors. So it's really important to, to celebrate the, the identity. And if I may say, Busy, that I also have an obligation, I think, because of being the first woman Metro Mayor, to lead with, um, with urgency about some of the most pressing issues of our decade. And one of them is violence against women and girls. And I have made that one of my pivotal and most important commitments to the community in West Yorkshire. And one of the best decisions I made, I think, in the first week was to ask Alison Lowe, um, who some of you may know if you're from Yorkshire. Um, she was uh, the chair of the police and crime panel. She ran a big mental health charity called Touchstone. And as a woman of colour, she also has her own lived experience, as well as being, like myself, a, a victim of sexual assault. And so can bring our own experience to the role. And as two women side by side leading on this agenda i'm hoping that we can really make a difference and uh bring bring that priority uh, to stop violence against women and girls um and to try and make west yorkshire one of the safest safest places to be a woman or a girl as a priority and using my my um the the, the freshness i suppose of this role and to have a woman in it as a um a hook to hang exciting policies on. So um, it is in incredibly um, humbling. And it, it is a bit sad though that my mum is still dreams of me going back to Coronation Street. And I think, I think there's nothing in the world apart from being queen that she would be prouder of. Uh, but I keep saying to her, mum, I, I have a budget of 38 million a year for 10 years. Oh yeah, but you were so good in Coronation Street. <laughs> Um, so I, I do think there's nothing that I can do that will please my mum, uh, but I, I am very proud and extraordinarily humbled, but also grateful to all the women around me that have helped elevate me, and I hope then I will be able to elevate others into senior positions as well. Thank you, Tracy. Like you rightly said, you're yeah, definitely still more Metro Mayors called Handy. What's your relationship like with the other Metro Mayors? And do you still feel like, do you still feel that sometimes you still have to justify your seat at the table? Well, well, I don't know whether it's been Northern, I don't know whether it's been working class, but of course that, um, you know, that critical monkey is always on your shoulder. But what was, what was helpful was that I had that same, um, imposter syndrome, becoming a member of parliament. I hadn't been in the building. I hadn't even been to a constituency Labour Party meeting before I became a, an MP. I felt all the time, I, there was so little I knew. And I was so afraid of being caught out, 
and called out and somebody say, what are you doing here? And I think there's something about being an actor that that fake it till you make it, that nobody knows how you're feeling inside. And I think if you just keep smiling and nodding um, and have good notes and a bit of research, then you can sort of get away with it. So I remember that feeling from being an MP. And so when it came around again, um, oh my goodness, I, I don't know how to be a mayor. Actually, I, I could just reflect and think, I knew absolutely nothing about how to be a member of parliament. And I hope that just having, you know, achieved a great deal in five years, having spent four of those five years on the front bench, actually getting into the shadow of cabinet, um, I, I proved to myself that actually you can start with very little knowledge, but if you learn, uh, work hard and uh, listen to others, I think you can you can do a good job. So I was slightly anxious, but I also believe that um, I have a lot to give. And my lived experience, my parliamentary experience, also brought something new that potentially those male metro mayors could learn from me. There was a moment when we were talking about the M62 mayors and Andy and Steve and me, and I did think, oh, I don't want to look like we're in some sort of pop band um, where I'm in the middle of these two guys. So I think it's also about make, having my own identity, my own agenda, my own manifesto that is very much my voice um, to establish myself rather than being in a gang, but also the mayor of a region of 2.3 million people um, that is part of a group of other leaders in West Yorkshire. Because let's, let's not forget, it's not just about me. Um, I fit into um, the leaders group, which is five other leaders of the regions, um, uh, Calderdale, Kirklees, Leeds, Bradford and Wakefield. So we all work as a team. So, uh, you know, I, I was a bit intimidated, but I think if you can reflect on an experience that was similar and then how you overcome those obstacles and try and keep that in your mind, and think in a few months time, I'll know much more and I'll be better. And, you know, being honest at the beginning, I'm three days into the job or I'm two weeks into the job. And, you know, this is learning. I think it's good to be honest, but honestly, there are so many people, particularly in the House of Parliament, that don't work as hard often as women MPs, that um, don't know as much, that haven't as, as much lived experience, and yet they're still there. So I would always try and think of the person who potentially is not the, the best at their job and think, well, I, I know I'm definitely better than them. <laughs> so that's always quite reassuring. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. You've shared really, really practical tips and there's so much to learn from you. Your campaign was a resounding success on a very mixed election day for Labour. And those who volunteered for your campaign um, described how hope and future played a key part in your messaging. Why was that important to you? And why do you think, and what do you think that the rest of the Labour movement can learn from this? Gosh, that's, a, that's an amazing question. I think, well, I'm a natural optimist. But I also think after the horrendous 18 months we've had, I think we had to offer something that was about looking to the future, about rebuilding, but in a really positive way. Because often when we talk about working people, we focus very much on the difficulties they're having. As a labor movement, quite rightly, we talk about the rising, um, rising food bank use, about poverty uh, in children uh, across West Yorkshire, for example, or the lack of skills training or opportunities. But I also think as, as somebody that came from a background that was really tough, that we also as politicians have to offer solutions and have to offer an opportunity to absolutely fulfill your potential, that there is no limit to what you can achieve with the right politicians, with the right policies and with the right help and often emotional support. So I do think it's a confluence of my, my um, glass, definitely half full personality, but I also think look into the future and that the future must be brighter 
under Labour because why vote for us unless we can make life easier and bring more joy to people's lives? Because life is so short, it cannot just be bed and work or anxiety about paying the bills. And let me tell you, as somebody who's had three decades as a freelancer, my husband was a freelancer, that is very much the original gig economy, very much hand to mouth, often worrying about paying the bills, having to sell the house, selling a car because you hadn't put enough money away for your tax bill, or you had, but you had to spend it to live. I was on free school meals. My own kids have been on free school meals. I do understand hardship, but what kept me going was hope for a better future. And I think that's what Labour has to offer, which is a better future for the people of the con this country, that we can't be focused on internal wranglings or on the minutiae of you know, attacking a government. What people want to know is, you come with us, life will be better. And it can't just be empty sunlit uplands. We absolutely have to make it real. So that's why I think and Nan was really pivotal in this, identifying the policies, the manifesto pledges that were clear, that would change your life. So for example, better buses. Now that doesn't sound like a big deal for people who may not use the buses, but for a lot of people, and if I could just quickly tell you an anecdote of a recent journey, I used the buses and it was pouring down and there was a dad with his kid in a buggy. He looked really stressed. He was so stressed, he hadn't even put the, the hood down. The kid was soaking. He was waiting for a bus to Cottingley, which is one of the, you know, one of the poor, poor community in, in Leeds. The bus fell off the schedule. The next one was another hour. So he had to wait for another hour in the pouring rain. So he set off walking. My boss came another 20 minutes later and I passed him still walking. Now he would go home furious, wet, possibly late for supper, possibly late to pick up another child, furious. You know, where does that anger go? Where's that lack of control over your life? I think a simple thing, well, it's not simple, it's gonna be difficult, but something as, as clear as making bosses better could potentially make people's lives easier and bring a bit more joy or a bit more room for joy in people's lives. So I think those manifesto pledges, a thousand skilled jobs for young people, 5,000 affordable, sustainable homes, an inclusivity champion so that people know that their leader is listening to them, that they feel heard. I think those clear pledges um, were really helpful in positive calls to the to voters as well, that we could say, we have an offer for you that is a about a better West Yorkshire. You vote for Tracy and she will deliver for you. Life will be easier. And it has been so hard that even just taking a, an edge off some of that challenge um, so that people have more agency over their own lives, I think is gonna be something that I hope to achieve. But, you know, I, I am an optimist. And, and I think being optimistic draws people to you as well. I think that's also part of leadership is to offer something positive because otherwise, why do you want to spend time with someone in a room uh, for two hours on a wet Friday night, unless you believe that they offer something that is uplifting, that is um, you know, enjoyable and positive about the future? Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. I love your optimism. Now, you've been very, very busy since your election. Leading narratives, um, you've been leading initiatives and everything from do you know carbon emissions to um, violence against women? What has been the greatest challenge for you so far? And what are the issues that still keep you awake at night? What keeps me awake at night? <clears throat> do you know, I'm gonna be really, really honest. My two daughters, it's not the, jo the, the job particularly. It's because they are in London, they're both actors, They've had a really tough year because they can't get going. 
and I'm here in West Yorkshire. And I've had to make the decision to throw myself into this job. Now they are 28 and 24, so they're not babies and they're, you know, they're quite capable of looking after themselves. But it is my anxiety about their futures that then leads me into what keeps me awake, I suppose. It's the futures of the young people of West Yorkshire. And I, I've made it quite a focus of my manifesto is a better, brighter future for young people because they have had it so tough. They, you know, opportunities gone, dreams trashed, relationships that they could have had would now, you know, never happened. Um, uh, those LGBT youngsters that would have gone out to clubs to find their family, find their tribe, stuck in, in frustration, not knowing where they're going, suffering poor mental health. I, I do think that is one thing, that the future, and that's why um, the green agenda is really important because I know that can motivate uh, young people to get involved in politics and to see a future for themselves and to hear that young people are choosing not to have children because they, they are worried about the future uh, because of climate change. And you just think, you know, that anxiety is something that I carry uh, heavily on my shoulders. And I do want to have a narrative and an offer for them. And I, I think as well, that's why it's led me to really focus on the creative industries. Obviously it, it was my, you know, three decades. Uh, it's something I know well. I, I understand the power of the creative in industries for regeneration, for jobs and skills, for opportunities, um, but also for well-being. And social prescribing is is something that I really b believe can help us out of this dark period. But the creative industries are such a, a strong part of that, and that well-being and, and mental health. Um, I, I really do think young people's mental health is going to be really important, but I think also to give them hope for the future, we need as leaders to focus on uh, climate change as well. So I suppose it's two things. It's my, my own personal um, circumstances, but also their concerns about the future. And that drives me to look at opportunities for young people, well-being and climate change. Thank you, Tracy. So don't let that put you off. Don't let that put you off standing. <laughs> my, my moaning and worrying about my own kids. <laughs> they are very capable and they're just trying to make me feel guilty. So, you know, don't let it stop you. Yeah, but I love your honesty. I love your honesty and you're very down to it. Thank you so much for the things you've said so far. <laughs> So, so far, um, you faced more than your own fair share of sexism during your time in politics, uh, not least in relation to that off-shoulder dress that you wore in the chamber that um, inexplicably uh, cably generated a tirade of abuse. So I imagine on some level, most of us in public office can relate. So what are your tips, your practical tips for staying resilient in the face of misogyny or abuse? Well, for people who may not have caught it, it was um, an off-the-shoulder dress that I wore um, to an event, in uh, um, a UK music event in the day. And then there was a, an urgent question we were granted, and I was at the dispatch box. I also got a broken ankle, so I was hopping, and I was kneeling on the dispatch box, and my off-the-shoulder dress dropped just slightly, a little bit more than it would normally. Well, I got back to the office, and, and my Twitter feed was full of abuse, calling me a, um, a slag. I'd just been breastfeeding. I'd just been taken from behind over a wheelie bin. I mean, the sexualization of the abuse was just incredible. So I, I did feel an obligation as somebody in the public eye um, to speak out about it, because obviously there's loads of people in workplaces that potentially get that and don't have the opportunity. So we pushed back with a, a quite a jokey wry, you know, who knew people could get so overexcited about a shoulder um, uh, and uh, an eye roll. Anyway, that caught a bit of steam and uh, was shared. So then it got a lot of interest. So I auctioned the dress 
uh, there was an ASOS dress that I bought for 30 quid online for, on eBay and it made 20,200 pounds. And I donated the money to Girl Guides because they do brilliant work um, with body shaming for young women to try and give them self-confidence around um, shame in their bodies. But I think what really helped me, uh, I think in that is to not take it personally. They're doing it because they want to shut me up. They want to diminish me because they don't like seeing powerful women or even women speaking out um, in, a, in a powerful position. So I do think it's trying to reflect that if you, st if you run away from it and feel afraid or diminished, then they win. That's what they want. They want to make you feel um, anxious or um, terrified or whatever. So you can't let that happen. So I think to push back with humor, sometimes it's very uh, uplifting. And also I, I, try and, I try and think that the people who are doing it, and we saw this when there was the abuse of black players, that the people who are doing it are little kids often. Um, and I always have this image of somebody that's not the most attractive person, sat in their mom's back bedroom in Y fronts, eating a pot noodle and thinking, are you afraid of that person? Do you really care about their opinion? And if the answer is no, then try not to um, let it get to you. Of course, you can't be an idiot. If it's a death threat and it's credible, then you need to go to the police and all of that. But if they're just trying to hyper, you know, to use sexual language to diminish you, then just try and push back. Obviously, take a break from social media if it's upsetting you. But also, I, I find if you've got allies on social media and they can then amplify and we can all support each other, I think that's also helpful. So I remember at one point I was getting a whole load of abuse and I just asked my CLP to post pictures of me with animals and dogs and positive stories to just push the abuse further down the timeline so that when you get to my page, you just don't see it. And that's the thing, they want to be seen and they want to make you afraid or feel shame. And it, it is hard, I know, but try and develop that thick skin because if you, if you allow them in, then they win. And of course they can't win. Tracy, you've shared a lot of practical tips and really helpful points. So sisters, please don't forget to tweet. Um, your highlights, it's anything you've learned from Tracy so far. And don't forget to get your questions ready. So please don't forget, uh, because um, I'll be taking questions very soon. <laughs> so Tracy, um, you are a graduate of the LWN training program. <laughs> Though that was a while ago. Our current training focuses on understanding your own personal experiences and how these can shape your political narrative. You were an actress, you are an actress, and a TV writer by trade. So how has the art of storytelling helped you in politics so far? Um, that is a brilliant question. Can I just say, I did the LWN um, network training and left the training saying, I never want to be a politician. I never want to do that. That was horrendous. <laughs> and um, the media training we did, I was absolutely hopeless. <laughs> I couldn't gather my thoughts. I couldn't speak as myself. I didn't know what I thought. Um, and I remember the analysis at the end, you know, when they work, you know, they talk about your strengths. What, um, the, the conclusion was that I, I came across as a really normal person. <laughs> and um, I, I took that away as a positive, actually, um, but I, I did think I don't want I don't want to do it. But obviously, circumstances were such fate gets you in a position. And I was then subsequently incredibly grateful for the training because at least I had something to hold on to. But I would say that uh, being an actor, um, I think most actors have a great deal of empathy because you need empathy in order to understand a character and to find the reasons why that character would do something. So certainly empathy um, in the first six months, where, wherever I went, people would see me and burst into tears. And, you know, I, there was no politics being spoken. 
we were just all grieving. So I think empathy was very useful. I think being a screenwriter has helped in some of my writing, my speeches, being able to potentially tell a narrative. Um, but also that presentational, like I said, the fake it till you make it, um, trying to stay calm when in public, my maiden speech in the House of Parliament, you know, you know, millions see it around the watch um, House of Parliament TV around the world. And just trying to use those um, preparation skills as you would as an actor, um, trying to look like you're not terrified. Um, so those, those, those things have helped me enormously. But I, I'd also say the volunteering that I've done in my life has helped me. So I spent a number of years working with an organization from, called Freedom From Torture which works with torture survivors from around the world. I was running writers workshops and the people I met in those workshops probably taught me as much as, I don't know, acting about the human condition and the power of forgiveness and the power of a story of a, a, a lived experience. So I think um, I would encourage everybody on this call to Try, you know, to do the things that you are interested in. It might not lead you to a political life, but who knows where it's going to lead you going on. So um, there are many things that contributed to where I am, but certainly people would say, oh, you're really comfortable with media. Just to, to finally say, I was never comfortable with media because as an actor, you do your work, you do your prep, you learn your lines, you hit your marks, and you know you've delivered a great performance. Um, when you're a politician, you're always improvising because you're always on the back foot because you don't know what's coming at you. So I always used to finish media and really beat myself up. Sometimes I cry after maybe a poor, you know, politics show or something because I'd feel so ashamed of myself that I got my lines wrong or I didn't say this thing that was right. And then you just, you just have to forgive yourself. And my high expectations of a performer were actually not very helpful when you need agility as a politician when you're being interviewed. And hopefully over the years, I've got to understand um, how you can pivot, how you can get back to what you wanted to say, how you decide even before you go on the show, what was the, what's the point you need to land? So I've learned a hell of a lot. Uh, but at the beginning, it was weird that being an actor actually was making me beat myself up. But there are positives as well to that background. Fantastic. Thank you, Tracy. You mentioned your maiden speech. Your maiden speech was amazing, by the way. Um, I love the tribute to Joe as well. Too. So I'm sure that uh, sisters would love to ask questions and I'm um, just looking into the chat box. Please indicate if you would like, if you'd like me to bring you in to ask um, Tracy your question directly or if you'd like me to um, read out your question, please type it into the chat box. But you can also use the raised and function just down below. So the raised and function, so please hit the raise hand function so that I can um, know that you would like to speak. So I can call you in to speak rather. So I'd like to start with uh, Terry, please. Terry, Anna. Hi, yeah. um, I'd like to ask Tracy, what can, what can I do to try and convince Arme, Mera, Nora um, to bring our buses in house. Who's who's your mayor? Did you say? No, Norma, Norma Redfern, North Tyneside. Uh, Norma might not have those powers of the Metro Mayor, isn't it, Jamie Driscoll? Yeah, but Jamie's because Norma is for North Tyneside. I feel like I should be approaching her, although Jamie is more approachable. If that makes any sense. I think I think Jamie has the Jamie is the metro mayor with the powers. There are there are um, there are two types of mayors. There's um, oh, what's the word a city mayor, um, which would have the ceremonial chains and go to events in their community. That's Norma. 
Yeah, they don't have those powers. Jamie would have the powers. Um, and, and the Metro mayors have powers that are given to them through the devolution deal. So they have powers and they have money. And I can't tell you after being a backbench MP for five years, to have no power and no money, it is very refreshing to have power and money. Um, but, but I would say approach Jamie Driscoll. I know that he's talking to bus companies. He did speak to me the other day about it, but he is definitely the person you need to speak to. I know he's always knocking on ministers' doors, asking for more money for all kinds of things. He's, he's a bit like a terrier. Once he gets his teeth in the bit, he doesn't like to let go. So if, if I write to Jamie and give him my views and how passionate I am about bringing the buses in-house, yeah? Excellent. I think that's a good idea. And, of course, there's an opportunity to um, have an enhanced partnership, which is what I'm doing in the first instance. So we're applying to government for extra money so we can make buses better now today um, rather than waiting for the government process. They've had the government have forced a timeline on us that to bring buses back into control is going to take a, a couple of years at least. So I've allocated a million pounds for that work to start now. Oh whilst also enhancing the bosses today. Um, so, yeah, Jamie's your man. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for your question. Um, thank you for the response, Tracy. I would like to bring in Alison here, please. Alison. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, hi, Tracy, and congratulations on your election. Um, I was so super thrilled for you. And I'm also really pleased about Alison Lowe, who's going to take over your police and crime commissioner work. And, and I was like, you know, running for election in tandem over in North Yorkshire as a police, fire and crime commissioner candidate. And my question to you is, as I was doing that, I started to realise how vitally important the role of crime commissioners are. And we have an epidemic of violence against women and girls. And my view is, I don't know if you agree, that Labour really needs to recalibrate its priorities in terms of how much effort we put into getting more women in as police, fire and crime commissioners. I mean, it's fantastic we've got three LWN graduates in post, but we need more because I'm not sure people realise the huge purchase that commissioners have on outcomes for women and girls, right from what the police do through the criminal justice journey when they're, you know, providing advisors through to the victim support services. It's a hugely important role and we need more women in the job. So are you able to use your position now within the party to say, come on, we need to really look at these commissioner um, elections when they come up and indeed any new mayoral elections and put sort of more effort into them? I'd be interested in your view. Alison, you're absolutely right. And thank you for stepping up. It is an amazing job, Police and Crime Commissioner, because you have the power to hold the Chief Constable to account. And if you don't feel that they are serving the community in the way you, you believe, you <coughs> have the powers to, in the worst case, you get rid of them. So it's you're absolutely right. It's an enormously powerful position. But the Mayor, with the, the Police and Crime uh, responsibilities coming together is the sweet spot because actually you can bring up back you can bring together that public health approach so that is about housing it's about transport it's about the safety of women on transport where women live um, in, in um, safer communities you know you can bring all that together and also your powers of convening as a mayor you can bring people together to um, on that journey and certainly Alison and I have hosted a number of round tables with women from all over the region saying finally we're getting that umbrella to uh, work together so I've been able to allocate 3.5 million on this work We've committed to, um, I think it's 15 independent sexual violence advisors. Alison and I walked the journey from the front door of the Sexual Assault Referral Centre through the process out the other side and able to share that experience as two women leaders and you know, then feedback to the Chief Constable about what we feel we could do better. But that's why 
um, leading on our police and crime plan consultation, saying to women in our community, this is your chance to really put uh, our experience at the forefront of the plan. And interestingly, having a meeting with Jess Phillips the other day, she said just the very fact that you're in post is helping women and girls. She said, you know, I am an MP for a region where my own mayor hasn't even reached out to me to, to discuss this, which is, seems crazy as she's on the front bench with this responsibility. But I would say your point is, is right, that we should really amplify the opportunity for Labour PCCs around the country to work with Labour MPs, Labour councillors and Labour mayors to really set the agenda. And it's an extra funding stream as well, let's not forget, to deliver for our communities and antisocial behaviour, um, uh, speeding cars, um, uh, you know, the safety on the streets and, and transport. We really have an opportunity to make a difference there. And if you go into politics for any reason at all, surely it is to make a difference to people's lives. And the PCC really does have the key to that. And, and do stand again, Alison. <laughs> Keep going. Thank you, Tracy, for your response to that question. And I really appreciate the fact that uh, sisters um, have lots of questions for Tracy, but I will appreciate if your questions can be as brief as possible, because our time is almost fast spent. Um, please, I'd like to bring on Ali. Ali. <laughs> I think you're on mute. Do you want to unmute yourself or? Okay. Hi, Tracy. Congratulations yet again um, for everything. Um, one question I would ask about um, Leeds and everything. I'm sorry I was late to the meeting. Something else came up. Quite brief. Um, I read the report that Yorkshire and Humber will be receiving, I have done always, 20 plus percent more than any other area of immigrants. And Everything you're talking about, women and safety and whatever, do you, with our council, have a plan to, uh, I don't need to outline, but how do I work with you and the councillors to try and support this, you know, the influx? Because a lot of them will be very vulnerable women and children. I don't know if that makes sense. This is why I don't stand for Parliament. I hate public speaking. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Ali. And um, honestly, it's tragic what we've seen across the world and particularly in, in Afghanistan. And if courage calls to courage everywhere, the, those women walking the streets ca together, campaigning for uh, freedom to be themselves with the Taliban watching them, absolutely phenomenal but we know that we're going to get a greater influx of um uh afghan refugees there's no doubt about it now we know in the north we have often taken a greater percentage of those refugees that come into the country in these crises um potentially for positive reasons because there are communities already established that they would feel welcome the house prices and rents are lower so it more likely to keep be able to keep families together so what we're saying is we have always been welcoming we will always open our arms to those in crisis from across the world but government needs to step up and help us and give us the resources to to give those families the best possible start and we've experienced with um, Syrian families um, and certainly if you have um, the courage to launch yourself and your children on a dinghy across the sea, what you're leaving behind must be worse than that. So we always have to bear in mind that the trauma that they, are, they must arrive with. Um, and in fact, if anybody hasn't seen it, there's a, a, there was a really great play at the uh, Leeds Playhouse, Freedom 21 which um, was brilliant about the, the journey and the experience. And in fact, those two actors were both refugees themselves from, uh, from Iran, and one of them is now going to drama school. So, you know, these are 
these are people who will contribute to our to our lives and let's not forget um our region had um immigration from uh, from uh, Ireland, the, uh, the Catholics, came, Irish Catholics came over to work in textiles. Then there's South Asian uh, uh, and you know Windrush, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We are richer because of immigration, but you cannot allow it to fail by underfunding us and not giving us the resources, not just for today, but for programs of support that go on, not just ESOL today, but support for youngsters getting into school, et cetera, et cetera. So Ali, if you want to reach out to my office, I can of course put you in touch with people. Um, uh, Yorkshire, Migrant Yorkshire, is that the title? Migrant Yorkshire are very, very good with the work that they do as well. Thank you for that. Yes, yeah, so I've been putting out to our CLP, but hope to work with them. Um, I mean, I mean, so yes, but um, I've sort of come up with a kind of headband plan, but to raise money as well. But thank you for that. At least I now have a, another point of contact. And I'm sorry I missed you on Saturday. All right. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Ali, and thank you, Tracy. Our time is almost fast spent, but I'd like to take two more questions, please. Um, I would like that to be as brief as possible. Can we take them together so I can answer as many as possible? Okay. Okay, fantastic. So I'd like to bring in Marie, Jill Lasme, and Saima Afkal. Thank you, Marie first, and then Saima. Um, I'd like, um, uh, uh, congratulations to Tracy. I'd like to ask, um, with, with regards to, you did mention some um, misogyny in our society, which is true, and is quite very present in the society. What will it take in this society where we have the queen who's a woman as head of state, we have the, our home secretary is a woman, one of our metro, met police is a woman, and then you are the first, you know, metro mayor, a woman. What will it take for this nation to stop violence against women? What will it Because I'm fed up with the latest victim of, uh, the murder, young woman's been murdered in this on the street in London, and I'm fed up. We had an outcry with Alice, and nothing happened, and it still goes on. Simon, please. Simon, do you want to come in? So, sorry, um, I'm deaf in one ear, so I'm getting an echo. So, I, I'm sorry if I repeat myself. Um, I'm apologies for being late, but my question is actually similar in terms of, but not just violence against women, because, you know, that's the work I do. And I, you know, I came in at the point where you talked about police and crime commissioners, and I was an assistant police and crime commissioner at one point. And what I tried to do was take on the whole agenda of not just crisis point intervention, but some of the early intervention within communities, structures, families, etc. And in doing so, um, my question is, I was also a councillor, but now an ex-councillor. Uh, the reason for that is I was trying to tackle the misogyny from within our own structures. And in doing so, I have been targeted and removed. So all these things that we're talking about don't happen in silos. So violence doesn't happen in silos. So how do women like me who don't fit, who don't typically fit the Muslim stereotype, who support LGBT communities, refugee communities, men and women, how do we get a platform? Yet we're intelligent, we are articulate, we comply with the law, but we are targeted. So. I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, and the very fact you're on this call, proves you've got the courage to speak up and you know you're being heard and you are a leader because you're here um both questions around violence against women and girls i can imagine probably one in three of the women on this call have had some sort of sexual assault violence um inappropriate behavior stalking all of those things we won't end it overnight but what is really important for me is I've come into this role and there is a fair bit of money and structures and work in place to support the victim. Those oh. safety nets, those, you know, those potential refuges, et cetera. There are so many organizations that do brilliant work as well to protect the victim. Oh, what I want to do is I want to understand why men continue to harm women, why men want to continue to hurt and diminish women. Oh. And it isn't just women, of course, because the, the majority of violence against women and girls and men and boys is perpetrated by men. So what I want to do, and this is what I've tasked Alison with, 
and in our police and crime plan is to get further upstream. So whilst I don't have powers over, for example, early years, because I would then I would institute sure starts across the whole of West Yorkshire if that was in my gift. What I want to do is I want to make sure we have early intervention so that those young men are su supported at a point when they potentially could be trauma, traumatized by something in their life that then turns into anger, that then turns into hatred. So for example, in the police and crime plan, we've made um, uh, misogyny and incel terrorism part of our plan. Where do we find, you know, what's the initiatives we can do to uh, work with experts to identify the incel um, grooming movement? Where, where, where is the stuff we can do upstream that um, uh, empowers good men to step up and be good and be by, proper bystanders to support women. I'm supporting um, what's called a Paul Ed program that's going into schools to talk in uh, when children are very young about consent, about respect, about what relationships, love, and affection means, but also to talk to young women that what good looks like and what a good relationship looks like. Because let's not forget. There are a fair number of young women that don't know and don't have any examples of a good, healthy relationship. So what I want to do is I want to stop the violence, not necessarily just scoop up after the violence has happened. And that's why I'm championing um, uh, uh, campaigns on the buses about violence uh, zero tolerance for sexual violence. And we've seen on the trains in West Yorkshire the same campaigns because I think the time has come to say zero tolerance of the, this violence um, and sexual uh, predatory nature against women. But we, you know, this is a, a problem that has been with us for time immemorial. But I know it's often filed in the too hard box. But if we can just make a tiny difference, if we just stop one or two women being raped, hurt, assaulted, whatever, well, that would have been a good day at the office. So we are trying to get upstream. And that's why I was saying it's, it's so exciting to have the PCC and the mayoral role, because those two can come together to have that public health approach, to get that early intervention, to, to ensure we tackle men's mental health. That means that they potentially are isolated and then can get dragged into um, you know, bad thoughts and the wrong way of thinking. Um, and also, you know, anger management. So when people say he just lashed out or it was one punch, we also need to um, have that, you know, have that help uh, for, for men when they're reaching out uh, for help with them, their anger. So um, that was not the clearest of answers, but let me tell you, I am completely focused on this as a priority. And if you have any good practice on any great ideas, the time to offer them up is now because I want, the, I want your great ideas in the police and crime plan. The consultation is out there. And um, if I may ask LWN, if you wouldn't mind, if I share it as an email, maybe we could share it amongst the members. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. And thank you for taking the time to respond to the questions from our sisters. I can see that a lot more sisters have questions for Tracy, uh, but unfortunately, due to time, we'll not be able to take all your questions. I apologize. Um, however, Tracy, we like to share any concluding remarks for our well, ladies. sisters. Well, I want to thank you for chairing so brilliantly. Thank you for all attending. And I just want to say, you are all leaders. You are all extraordinary women because you are stepping up and wanting to learn from others and wanting to share your own experience with honesty and candor and, um, and emotion as well. So thank you for your brilliant questions. 
thank you for the support you've shown me over the decades that I've been um, uh, associated with Labour Women's Network. You have some phenomenal leaders in uh, your um, organisation as well. And thank you for being such a great supporter for me. And, you know, I'm your friend. We will work together. Anything I can ever help with, I always will. And positivity, I think, is the way to diminish um, that misogyny and that sisterhood and standing together uh, is a way that we can really push back against those that want to make us feel small. So thank you for everything. And I look forward to coming back, you know, maybe in another six months or whenever to talk about hopefully the impact that some of my changes have made. So thank you all so much. I've now got to deliver a speech for the Council of Mosques. So <laughs> um, uh, do excuse me, but thank you ever so much, everybody. It's been great to see you all. And thanks, Nan, you're a legend. Bye. Thank you, Tracy, and bye. Thank you so much. Bye. So sisters, for those who are physically attending conference, we have an event coming up, um, Sisterly Saturday, Smashing Structural Sexism. And this is on Saturday, 25th September at 8 p.m. Um, at Holiday Inn, Brighton, no registration is needed. Uh, some of our guests include the Unison, Jetsec, uh, we have Antonit Wumble, we have MPs, um, Abna Apong Asare, Dame Diana Johnson, Talib Sadiq, and Alex David Jones. And also, sisters, you are invited to join the Labour Women's Network. Please don't forget to do that. We were founded over 30 years ago to secure women's equality in the Labour Party. We are the only official women's affiliate to Labour. Through our training programs at political school and the Joe Cox Women in Leadership program, we train women to change the culture in their local parties, to stand for public office and be ready to lead. Please follow us on social media at Labour Women's Net. And don't forget, sisters, to support and amplify each other's voices. Thank you all so much for joining me this evening and have a good night. Bye. <laughs> bye bye. Bye sisters. Bye everyone. Bye. That was fantastic. Bye, bye everyone. Bye. Thanks for Bye. 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 See you conference. Wait. Exit. Close.